Great. I think we're now recording as well. So um, the first fly that I'm, I'm going to tie um, is one that actually might um, interest a couple of uh, uh, if, if you, you chaps who were talking about um, the, the hill locks of Scotland. Um, this is one that um, I, I, I find very successful uh, um, up on the wild lakes in Scotland and also and also Wales. Uh, during, during the summer, I do do a lot of float tube fishing in, in the Welsh mountain lakes and um, this this fly is is one that um, that I came up with a few years ago and is virtually always on my cast um, throughout throughout the summer. It's um, it's a variation of the, the, the traditional fly, the Zulu, um, but it's it, it incorporates the um, uh, the features of the the popular sedge hog flies, which are really good functional flies as well for fishing fishing on the surface for for wild wild trout. So I've got a size twelve barbless. Uh, wet and dry hook, so it's it's uh, one gauge heavier than a, a dry fly hook, but it's still quite quite light. Perfect for for these 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 wet flies. Um, this particular model is the the Fish On brand um, wet and dry hook. I would normally tie this in in a size fourteen is probably my 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 favourite size, um, and also size twelve. This is a size twelve, so it, it'll show up a bit better on the screen for you guys. I'm using black. Um, Ultimate tying silk from, from Fish On as well. This is uh, stuff I use pretty much all the time for my flies, except for um, <clears throat> from tying spiders or uh, other things. I very rarely use standard um, standard tying threads. This this, this silk is, is 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 amazing. So I just put a bed of that silk onto the hook shank, and then the next material is uh, Glow Bright floss, Glow Bright number four. This forms the, uh, the, the the tag of the fly. So I just cut off a good length of that and then just double it up once, and then double it up twice. And then for the, I'll actually double it up four times to get the right thickness, but what I'll do here is just put it to the thread, wrap it around the thread, and then just create a create a loop to catch it onto the onto the thread, and then catch it onto the shank of the hook. It just saves having to mess around cutting tag ends off, and it it, it saves saves wasting the material as well. So I tie that on really nice and tightly with touching turns down to about the about level with the hook point. And snip off to create a, a tag just like that. The one thing I should have mentioned before I um, before I started is you, you might notice that the way I've put the hook in the vise, I've angled it slightly upwards, so so the eye is is, is facing upwards. Um, and you'll 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 see when I get to the end of the fly why why I've done that. But it's it, it's uh, quite a useful thing to do when when working with um, with, with deer hairs I, I find or, or elk hair. So the next part of the fly is um, black seal spur. Just, uh, just standard, genuine dyed black seal spur. Dub that onto the, onto the thread. And then I'm going to create a dubbed body up to about just past halfway up the hook shank. <clears throat> There's quite a lot going to go on at the at the, at the front end, end of the fly, so going about halfway up is about about right for one of these um, what we call half hog type flies. Um, I, I, gen I generally have a rule because there, there, are, there are two types of flies in this family. There's, there's, there's the sedge hogs, um, which have more tufts of, of deer hair or elk hair going through the body, and, and I generally will use four or five maybe six um, on a size 10 hook, but half hogs I tend to define as having three tufts of, um, of hair. So before David, I may, the... may I interrupt you for a question? Yes, please. Um, you, you said you choose a hook for dry flies and uh, wet flies as well. Yeah. Um, for me, I'm, I'm new to uh, trout fishing like one and a half years now. And when I tie wet flies, I use a bit heavier wired hooks. 
because um, it's more easy to get the fly down. I don't know if you fish it on a system, this uh, this fly, or if you fish it single on the leader and, and weight your leader a bit with, with tungsten uh, or stuff like that, a split shot or whatever. Yeah, I'll, talk, I'll tell you how I, I, I fish this fly. This is actually, and there's a deliberate reason why I've used a lighter wire hook. Um, this, this fly is designed to fish pretty much as a dry fly up on the surface. And um, what I'll do with flies like this is fish them. They're very versatile. You could, you could fish them as a dry fly initially, cast them out, leave them for about a few seconds, and then start pulling them through the, through the surface like a wet fly. So they create a wake, and that's very often when the fish triggers. So, and I'll also fish this fly as a team of, of other flies. If I'm fishing right up on the surface of the water, I'll put a, um, a similar fly, probably a, a more dull colored fly on the point. So a sort of more standard sedge hog that, that sits high, high up in the surface film and then put a, a submerged wet fly in the middle, like a dabbler or something like that. And then I'll fish this one on the, on the, on the top dropper on the bob. So it creates like a washing line setup, keeps all the flies right up in the surface. It has two flies that create a wake when you can pull them. And I find that is really, really effective for fishing for wild brown trout on, um, on, on, on these uh, UK, UK lakes. Okay, so um, it's it's more easy to fish uh, hooks like this in a, in a still water area uh, than in a, than in a creek or a river because I think uh, the uh, the current gets the fly more up then. And yeah, now yeah. in this case, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Now this is exclusively a, a lake lake fly st for still waters um, designed designed to stay right up in the surface. And what I'll do is I'll actually use um, Use a lot of gink to, to keep the fly floating as, as, as high as possible. And you fish them quite quite slow, I guess. Depend, yeah, I mean, it depends on what the fish fish fish, fish like. You know, on some of, some of these wild fish will chase a fly that's going quite fast, and some days that's the way to provoke a take, particularly in like windy conditions. But there are other times where they, they want it absolutely dead static. If there's a hatch going on, things like heather flies or mm. other terrestrials, which this fly does suggest. Um, then having it static in the surface films often often the way. Um, but I will tend, I like to fish um, a combination of both. So I'll fish it as a dry fly initially, leave it for a, for a while. If I don't get any takes, I then start pulling to, to, in, to induce a follow and a take. And that, that seems to be quite effective. Okay, thank you. Okay. So the next, next um, item is some um, knotted pheasant tail in black. To create create the legs, I'll take six of these. I mean, I, I know you know natural insects have have six legs. I know fish can't count, so it doesn't matter. Um, but I'll do six, um, and it also gives um, plenty in case they start dropping off after being chewed by trout a few times. I'll just take a, a clump of six pre knotted tail fibers there. And I'll just put those over the top of the hook, over the deer hair. And so the legs extend a little bit just beyond the, the, the tag. So you can see that's about the right, right length. So there's a, there's a little bit of tra trailing legs there. So I'll just tie those in with a pinch and loop right on top of the hook shank. If you're being really precious about it, you can, you can, you know, you can separate those legs out and you can orient them in the right direction, or you can have three on one side. Um, to be honest with you, I, I tend to just leave them like that because after a, after the, after a few false casts, as soon as I hit the water, those those legs are going to move anyway, and especially after a fish or two, um, they um, they just end up starting training behind the fly, and it, it doesn't really make any difference to the, the fly's effectiveness. There's also a reason why they're up in that direction as well and not in the standard style that most modern modern hoppers, particularly the ones you see tied in, in, in magazines these days. Um, there's, 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 a, there's a fashion for having hoppers legs going below the hook shank, which is 
probably great for a low riding fly like a like a standard hopper when you're fishing it's static like a as a dry fly because those legs just sit in the surface film when you've got a fly here that you want to fish in really windy conditions and you want to sometimes pull it across the surface i find that having the legs in that direction creates a sort of air of um, hydrofoil and it just helps keeps the fly up in the up in the water and, and, and maintains that profile that that looks really good for the to the fish from from below so the next stage is to um, put in the wing and i'm using elk hair dyed black elk hair you can you can use deer hair for this particular fly i quite like the elk hair because it just gives a bit of extra buoyancy i do find it 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 keeps the fly up for longer and it's a bit easier to maintain after after se several fish have, have, have eaten it I find sometimes the, the deer hair um gets gets destroyed on the trout's teeth quite a lot so i'll just put that in the hair stacker and Give it Tim Wood's marriage saving tip rather than banging it on the desk. <laughs> so there's a nice, fairly sparse clump of, of, of hair, and I'll, I'll lay that over the top of the, the legs. And I don't want this too long. You can make a mistake here by having the wing going too long and extending down as far as the legs, but I tend to have this um, extending just to about the, the end of the tag. That, that, that's, that's about right to get the correct profile. So tie that in with a good series of loops to make sure it's it's fixed. You've got to be careful with this elk hair when you're using silk threads because silk threads are about the strongest material um, that I'm, I'm using. And the elk hair is about the most fragile material. So it's very easy just to cut right into the hair. So I tend to do very loose turns at first and then progressively tighten them up just to secure it in. Then the next stage is to basically create a sandwich of, of, um, of seals fur between, between these clumps of deer hair. So I'll just put another pinch of the black seals fur on. And this will just go over the top of those, those cut ends. And it creates a little spacer between, between the successive wings. And then it's simply Repeating the process again with, with more, more elk hair. Into the hair stacker. Trip off the tags again. And then one more sandwich of seals fur. So remember I said this is a, a half hog design, so it's got three sets of, of elk hair in, in the wing. So this will be the final stage. <coughs> Final piece of elk hair.
and you can just pull out any bits that don't line up properly from, from this. Or any stray butt ends. Now this is the bit that um, you'll notice why I've put the hook facing slightly upwards, because there's quite a lot of material there right at the um, at the end of the fly. And quite often you find that if you, um, when you cut this final bit of um, L care from, from the, the head of the fly, quite often, particularly with these silk threads that are quite smooth and shiny, um, your bobbin can jump off the fly and then everything you've just tied just explodes which is really, really annoying. So I tend to just angle the, the hook slightly upwards. So it just keeps the, the angle of that thread facing, facing backwards. So I can snip that off with confidence knowing that it's not gonna jump off. And then it's simply a case of just forming, forming the head. Now you can put a extra piece of uh, bit of seal's fur on the head there just to um, cover the threads. Um, I tend to not do it because I just find it makes the, the head of the fly just look a little bit bulky. So I'll just leave it as a as a as a as a, a whipped whipped head. So I'll just tie that off with a whichever way you want a whip finish tool or my half hitch tool. And that's the finished fly. You can see that that's um, it's basically a, a half hog fly that's that's got the features of the traditional Zulu and, and and I've added legs to it and it's an absolutely deadly fly for for the brownies of the uh, the wild lakes of Scotland and Wales. Anybody got any questions for Dave? Well, I, yeah, I've got one. Yeah. Uh, well, I might have skipped two pages as usual, but it's got no wonder body, has it? Yeah, it's got no. seals fur. Just got seals fur. Yeah, in, in between the clumps of the deer hair, eh? yes. No, at the back as well. I told you I'd skip two pages. <laughs> <laughs> if, I turn it, if I turn it upside down for you, uh, that's, that's the underside of it. It's basically... You just create a continuous body of seals for going right, right through. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And then, um, yeah. Well, what I'll do, what I'll often do now is just rough it up um, on the underside. So, using a using a Velcro stick or whatever, if you if you rough up the seals for, and then almost co comb it in an upwards upwards direction. There you are. I had um. Scottish, it upwards. Scottish Gilly once who said to me that it works very well on red, but you should try it in Kingfisher Blue. Oh right, yeah, yeah, like a blue, like a blue well. Zulu. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are lots of variations of this fly. You can you can tie them um, as, as 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 brown, so they, they they look more like a sedge, or you can um, you can do them with a, a, a yellow tail, like a Kate McLaren, for example. Um, this this is this is this is just the one that I, I really like. Um, I find it very effective. The Zulu. So that's the first fly. The other thing I'd, I'd say is with the seals fur combed up into the um, into the wing, it just creates lots and lots of um, opportunities for the for air to get trapped. So it, it really enhances the buoyancy of the fly, but it also means there's a, there's a really nice profile on the surface. So it's not a bulky fly at all. Um, problem with a lot of wet flies is if you want them to float and stay up, you have to put like make them in like size tens or and put loads and loads of big hackles. They you create this massive bumble type fly, which 
can be good. It's good for, you know, very windy conditions and sea trout, etc. But this fly is, is much slimmer in profile as well as being buoyant. Um, it looks very attractive. I should say that um, Derek has already taken photos of these these flies and put them on the um, on the Ludlow Facebook page, so you can um, go and have have a look at them there, and um, also get the um, get the full list of materials. I put them on the the WhatsApp group as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What I'll do later, I'll I'll repost them. Brilliant, thanks, Derek. So the, the next the next one is, is going to be a, a a dry fly using using deer hair again, but this one is for, uh, for rivers. It's a fly that's worked really well, particularly for the for the brown trout, um, and it's also a nice fly because it's it's extremely simple to tie. But it's important that um, the proportions of the different materials are, are correct, so um, so the fly functions well and, 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 and looks right. It's very easy to tie this fly wrong, so it looks like a, a you know a huge great um, chunk of <laughs> um, feather going on, on on the water. So, um, but it's a fly that works really really well throughout the season, and you can tie it in different different sizes. Um, a lot of people refer to it as uh, the retirer sedge. Now, the original retirer was it was it was uh, developed by a chap called David Parker, who, who um, a member of the England fly fishing team, um, a good few years ago when when the team were competing in Slovenia, um, and they came up with this fly um, during the practice sessions when none of the, their their um, normal flies were working. Um, and, and, and it proved really effectively in that, in that competition. Um, a lot of people refer to it as the retire of sedge, but in reality, um, you can tie this in different sizes and it, it very effectively imitates not only sedges, but also various, various upwing flies as well. So it's really, really good March brown pattern early in the season. And you can even tie it slightly smaller and it will do a pretty good job at, a, at an emerging um, large dark olive, for example. It's one of those flies that just um, works throughout the season and it really pulls fish up, even if fish aren't rising on a particular day. So what I'm gonna do is, is show you the, um, the sort of the original um, recipe for this fly. There's a lot of variations of it you see um, sold on the internet or on, on YouTube videos. And, and, and a lot of them actually miss out a lot of the, the really important um, features and materials of this fly that actually I think make it make it quite make it especially effective so hopefully you'll you can uh, see uh, what what you know what makes this fly you know a superb all-round pattern I've got a size 14 uh, dry fly hook in the in the vise uh, barbless fish on dry fly hook and this time I've got yellow uh, tying silk. The next material is, is this stuff. It's called Fish Yarn Ultimate uh, Ultra Dry Yarn in, in Dun Grey. It's very, very similar to um, like Tiemco Aero Wing. It's just a poly propylene yarn. Um, this particular one is a bit coarser and a bit, bit rougher. It, it, it almost looks like snowshoe hair fur actually, um, like a synthetic version of it, but it's very good because it's got, um, got air um, pockets, actually micro air pockets inside it. So it's really, really buoyant and doesn't, doesn't drown. So it forms, a, it's a great material for um, sort of synthetic wings or uh, under wings, for example. So what I'll do is I'm just going to Use, use this to create um, the, the, the tail end of the fly, a, a shuck, which looks like the, uh, uh, the, the, 
the old the skin of a um, at the larval stage of the insects after the, the adult fly hatches out. So I'll take this. This this, this comes in quite a, a thick a thick rope, so you can you can separate those out and um, pick out a piece that has the, the the right thickness for you. So I don't want too thick a, a trailing shut because it just represents the sort of empty skin that comes off the back of a of a, of a hatching insect. Um, so I'll just tie that in right down the hook shank to about the level with the level with the point again. It's quite quite long there at the moment. What I'll do is I'll I'll I'll, I'll trim it down to around about the same length as the hook shank. When I trim it, I don't want to create a, um, a very straight tag ends like I did on the on the previous fly. Um, to make this look natural, it's it's good to have a, a very rough tapered uh, tapered look. So going going in with the scissors at an angle um, and just trimming it very roughly is the way to do it. And I'm told by the original creator of this fly that this this trailing shuck, which often doesn't get, it sometimes gets gets left off some patterns that people refer to as the retirer. Um, apparently, this trailing shuck part is is really key to this fly's effectiveness at um, at getting the fish to take it. So the next material is um, squirrel fur. You can use hair's fur if you like. I like squirrel because it's a bit more spiky. And you can you can find a variety of fur, soft fur and spiky fur, depending on what part of the fly you're doing. I'm going to use more of the softer fur for this part of the, of the body of the fly. So I just dub on quite a slim, slim rope there. Try and get it so it try and get it so you got a taper. So it's sort of tapered from the back and, and progressively thicker. It just helps create that nice looking profile of the fly. And the style of this fly is, is just the same as that um, that Zulu pattern I tied earlier. It's 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 a it's a half hog style fly. But once again, I'll go just just beyond halfway up the up the hook shank to leave plenty of space for three sets of wings um, before the eye. And then rather than using elk hair, as we've done the previous fly, what I'm using now is perhaps the very finest of all the all the hairs. This is coastal coastal deer hair. Really lovely material, very, very fine. A lot of people who tie flies that they call the retirer will use elk hair or other things. And that's fine if you want a really buoyant fly for fishing, sort of, you know, fast, fast water. But um, the original, as I say, used, used coastal deer hair. And I think this, this makes a much more delicate fly um, for, for river fishing. You don't want a big clump of it. I tend to pick out around about up to 20, I suppose, individual individual hairs. So between 10 or 20 um, is ideal. You don't want this to be a really bulky fly in terms of the material used. It's, it's going to make um, best use of the air spaces to, to allow it to float on the surface. So I'll tie that in so uh, it, the, the tips of the, the fibers go just beyond the, um, the end of the hook. Being quite uh, gentle here though, when you tie it in with the silk because it's very, very brittle and easily, easily cut this, uh, this, this hair. 
once again to trim off the tag ends. And then like, like with the previous fly, I'm going to some squirrel dubbing in between in between the, uh, the clumps of wing. Okay, that's wing number one. Wing number two, rather than using the um, or the, um, the deer hair, I'm going to go back to this um, ultra dry yarn and put a, a clump of this in it's about the same thickness and density as the, as the deer hair, as, as the middle wing. Um, and this is really good because it's, it's ultra buoyant. It's very, very easy to maintain when you're on the river. So if you're, if you're catching, catching fish in quick succession, you can get this fly dry very quickly. Um, and back fishing again. So I guess that's why competition anglers develop this and um, really like using it because it's um, it's one of those flies that you can you can almost false cast to dry it and it's straight out there again and fishing fishing nicely. So I just get a, a clump of this ultra dry yarn. And place it on the hook so it's it's, it's, it matches up with the length of the, of the deer hair. And then that's followed by another section of squirrel fur. And then the last part of the wing is another, another clump of the coastal deer hair. Exactly the same thickness as, as previously. So somewhere in the region of up to 20 individual fibers approximately. Stuff gets everywhere, doesn't it? It does. There's all this, um, you get a lot of very soft underfur on these these flies. So what I'm doing here, I'm just um, I'm just trying to brush off, not knock off as much of that um, very fine underfur as possible. So that goes on again to the same same length as the other other bits of wing. Again, it helps if you, if you angle the hook so it's pointing slightly upwards in the vise. Because at this stage, when you're working at the eye, that thread can easily jump off. And then it ruins all the good work that you've just, just done. Okay, the final part of this fly is um, some more squirrel dubbing just, just to the head to, to finish the fly off. What I'll do now is I'll choose the more um, a more spikier patch of, of squirrel dubbing for the, for, the, for the head part of the fly. Because what this will do is it, it'll create a, a sort of, I suppose, hackled effect, but using, using dubbing. Again, another, I suppose, mistake that I sometimes see is people will put a put a feather hackle on and still call this fly the retirer. Um, that's not correct if you're 
going to call it the retirer because the original just had some squirrel fur at the, at the head end. So it just it just covers up all those those cut ends. And creates what probably on screen looks like a really scruffy looking ball of <laughs> fur and <laughs> and hair. <laughs> but uh, hopefully when it's finished, I'll I'll demonstrate why it's so effective. Just finish off there with um, quite like, like using the, 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 the wick finisher tool on, on, on these flies again, because it means I can push back the um, any stray bits of squirrel at the head and just the thread then just cleans the, the head out and, and opens up the eye. Sometimes with, with the wick finish tool, it just sort of jumps around at the front there and you end up with the eye still covered. And the final. I notice, Dave, you're plucking at the uh, at the skin rather than cutting the, the squirrel. Yes, yes. I'm. What I'm. Yeah, what I'm doing. Any any really long bits that are, that are sort of a bit too sticky out. I'm just I'm just picking them out. But I'm I'm using my fingers quite a bit to to sort of tease out the fibers on this. Um, but I'll also use the the the, uh, the dubbing needle on the head, just to pick out some of those those longer uh, longer hairs to create that that leggy effect of, of the head. No, the, Dave, Dave. What Tony meant was you were plucking the, the fibers off the, the 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 skin. The dubbing. Oh yes, yes, I was. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was. I, I just just plucking them straight off the skin. So that is the is the finished fly. I don't know what's the best. Yeah, now, as I was saying, it's um, it uses quite a lot of material, but not very large amounts of the material. So it has a lot of air spaces in it. Um, it's also um, a very, very soft fly. So when when the trout um, take takes it takes it, um, it, it, it collapses down very easily into the fish's mouth. Uh, and this this shuck at the end here is a very, very soft um, shuck that, that bends easily. So part of its effectiveness, I th I think, is when when a fish takes it, it just feels like a nice soft meal in its mouth. So you do get really positive takes and very good hookup rates as well. You brush the body of that upwards as well, Dave? You can do, you can do. Um, I tend, tend on this, Derek, just to, just to leave it as it is really, because um, it's sort of fa fairly rough as it, as it is and there's, there's a lot going on above the fly. So sometimes, you know, more defined body is quite, quite nice. Um, plenty of air in it. There's loads of air in it, yeah, yeah. It, it works really well as a, this is a size 14. That's the size I'd, I'd use most frequently on, on the local rivers to, to, to us in Shropshire. Um, it's very effective in a size 12, particularly if sedges are around or March browns, um, or if you're fishing very rough water and you're looking just to pull, pull the fish up from, from, from the bottom. Um, I'll also tie it in size 16 as well for, for, for you know, in, in, the, in the summer months when, when you get quite a lot of Quite small sedges coming coming around in the evening. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's a very effective fly um, in most situations on on, on rivers. If you, it's a it's quite a good pattern for uh, clink and dink as well. If you're using a small nymph behind it, yeah, as, yeah, as a searching pattern, you know. Absolutely, yeah, def definitely. It's 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 amazing for that. And I'll just um, yeah, actually, and um, I'll show you another variation that I I tie specifically for fishing the, the duo method. Um, I'll often add an extra um, extra bit of yeah. material. Um, bit of pink, bit of colour. Pink or orange. I, I tend to prefer orange, um, partly because uh, it, it shows up nicely, but also a lot of these natural sedges do have um, quite an orange um, tint to them. So yeah. what, what I've done here is the same fly, but I've just put 
um, a section of orange ultra dry yarn. So it's the same yarn I've used for the, 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 the shuck and, the, and, and the, the underwing. But I'll just put a piece of that at the very front of the fly yep. to create a sighter. Um, that, that's that re really effective pattern in the summer. If, you, if, you, if you're fishing the geo, um, you'll, 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 you'll catch plenty of fish. Plenty of yeah. fish will come take, take the dry as well. Yeah, if, they're, if they're a little bit quiet, you just use it as, as a searching pattern with a yeah. little behind it. Then yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fish. I mean, even this time of year, it can be good. I was, I was, I, I did actually, <coughs> um, fish, fish the duo for a little bit. Um, yeah. yesterday, actually, I was out on the river yesterday, um, and it was quite a cold day, so I was concentrating on nymphs. Um, the water's still very, very shallow in our rivers, and um, there were a few sections where the, the nymphs were just hitting the deck too too hard so i did actually put, 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 a, put one of these on um and a, and a really small nymph under it and i had several good sized grayling come out of nowhere and, and, yeah. and take the dry really really strongly mm. um it's quite amazing really um did you catch any lace leaves there was loads of leaves going down the river yesterday yeah oh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> they've all started falling haven't they they fight well. They fight pretty good. Yes. Yeah. 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 But, um, yeah. They're still they're still willing to rise actually, which, yeah. which is amazing. Even though there was no, they weren't rising to take any natural insects. They were literally coming out of nowhere. Um, I was fishing a size twelve version of this. I think it was. So it wasn't really, <laughs> it wasn't really representing anything that was naturally on the water. Yeah, as a searcher. Those, yeah. It was a, it's just a, it's an attractor, and those grayling were coming up and. and I probably caught as many grading on the dry as I did on the nymphs. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a really really good good fly. This um, in a lot of situations. Guys, sorry, um, I have to leave. I'm afraid. Thank you ever so much, Doctor Dave. Fantastic stuff. And uh, I shall see you adieu. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. All the best. Bye bye. bye. Yes. Cheers, mate. All the best, Dan. So I was going to move on to um, tying a few few nymphs now. Um, <coughs> those, those two flies are just tied are two that I think probably stood out for me over the course of the trout season this year, um, during the summer months. But um, you know, we're now we're now into the um, if you're a river fisherman into the, into the grayling season. Um, <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad there are some grayling fans on the, on the call. Um, and a lot of our grayling fishing is done under the water. Um, though, I was, like I was saying yesterday, the grayling were ready to rise to dry flies quite surprisingly. I, I think now the weather's really, really turned. It's getting colder and it's, it's, it's got wetter. Uh, it's probably going to be... Um, Mostly, mostly nymphs from now on. So um, I thought I'd just show you um, three three nymphs that have worked really well for me just in the last few few, few months or so of the of, uh, the back in the trout season and now the grading season. <coughs> the first one um, is is a variation of probably the um, the most classic grayling nymph of all time. I did. I did ask this question at the the unicorn. I asked everyone what what they thought was the uh, the most successful grayling pattern of all time, and I think several people um, said the killer bug. And um, I thought I'd just show you a, a variation of the killer bug. Sorry. That's also it, it been extremely effective. Um, it was really effective yesterday. I caught a very large grayling of over two pounds on, on this fly yesterday. Um, I also caught a very large out of season brownie um, as well. So it's not not just the, the, the grayling. Um, chub love it as well. Sorry. The chub love it as well. Oh, I bet they do. They're, 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 they're they're there are loads of chub in this river, but I hardly ever see them. This is a bit oh. strange. I fish the way a lot and uh, catch a lot of chub on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, 
this might not go down well with the, the Frank Sawyer purists. Um, as I say, this is a variation of the killer bug and it's, uh, it doesn't really um, use a lot of the, um, the, the original tying, tying sequence. This is, for me, it's a much simpler way of tying it, um, but it also creates a very functional and successful fly. So the first thing I'm going to do to, on this, this version, which is gonna probably make everybody um, hold their hands up in, in horror, is I'm, I'm using a jig hook and I'm using a, using a tungsten bead to give it weight. Of course, the original one was developed before tungsten beads were available and it used copper wire. Not only as the underbody, but also in, as, the, as the thread to tie, tie all, the, all, all the materials together. Um, this, I think, is a bit of a, a, a cheat compared to the original original dressing because the, it's the tungsten bead that gives it that uh, that weight. So I've got here a size size 18 wide gate jig hook. Um, and in there, there's a 2.5 millimeter tungsten bead. You can tie them in different different weights, three. Three millimeters to two, two and a half and two mils are the standard ones that I use for, for this pattern. I quite often fish it as a dropper fly if I'm using a team of nymphs or um, using the method that, that Gavin was just talking about uh, underneath the um, underneath the dry fly um, as, as a duo, really good searching pattern. Um, And then threads, I've got copper ultimate tying silk. So this is a this is a, a bit of a nod to Frank Sawyer, who used copper wire, very fine copper wire as tying thread. Um, this um, ultimate tying silk is a lot easier to use, and it's stronger than the original. But I'm keeping the uh, the original colour faithful to the original colour because apparently the, the the success of this fly was down to the um, the color of the the co combination of the copper color on the underbody, and the uh, the particular shades in the wool that um, that, that, that Frank Sawyer used. That when wet, it just created a, a really attractive fly. So I'm going to just create a um, an underbody of copper using this silk. So I'll go three times up and down the hook shank and just past the bend of the of the hook so you get a slight curve in there. And it also just locks that tungsten bead in place so it doesn't go, it's not going to wobble around. Okay, this is this is the uh, the real crux of the fly. Um, I'm not using the original Chadwick's wool that is extremely hard to find and extremely expensive. Uh, we had a big discussion about this at the uh, at the unicorn the other week, which was, was really interesting. It's good to see some some people still have have the original Chadwicks, but I came across this um, a few years ago. I think it was an article by by Dave Southall, um, or, or or some posts he put on Facebook where um, he was tying a version of the killer bug, and, and, and uh, people had, had discovered this um, this this wool which seems to be an almost identical substitute to the original Chadwick's. You can, you can buy this online. Um, Derek, Derek put a, a link to the, um, uh, to the website where you can, you can buy it online. And it's, it's pretty cheap. Uh, I think this, this ball of wool, which will probably last me a lifetime, cost about, I don't know, three, three or five quid. It was, it was just posted, posted down to me from Scotland. So, um, it's 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 a really good really good good idea, and it does seem to have almost an identical colour scheme to the to the original Chadwick's. I put it on the WhatsApp group, Dave. That's right. Yeah. So we just tie that in from the. I'm just behind the bead. Oh, 
nice and nice and tightly. And I'm just going to go to just on the bend of, of the hook there. So not as far as as where I went with the original um, thread underbody. So probably leaving about a millimetre or two millimetres of that copper thread at the back there, because the original Sawyer's Nymph had, it was tied from the back back to front and, and it had a, like a, a, butt, a butt end of, of copper wire. So it's a little nod to, to that, um, that style. I mean, there's been, you see lots of um, analysis on, on, on these, these flies and about why they're so effective. And I, I did read somewhere that, um, that that copper wire at the butt end represents the, um, the, the head and the mouth parts of a, of a crane fly larva um, that, that lives, in, lives in the water, which, which could be true. I mean, whether the fish actually pick that out or not, I don't know, but um, it, it, you know, it could be a trigger feature. And then what I, what I do now with the wool is, is try and create that um, an ideal profile. Uh, it's a very, very, very simple fly this, but the key to its success is getting the right taper and profile. So basically it needs to be a, a sort of a, a typical grub, grubby looking fly, um, sort of uh, tapering from the, the rear end to the, to the head end. So to do that, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll undo the twists in the rope so it flattens it. And then I'll start winding with touching turns very, very tightly to start off with. So it flattens that, that wall right down. And then as I come up, I'm going to start twisting, twisting the threads slowly as I'm wrapping. And I'm also going to release the tension on the turns. So what that does, it just makes the, the thread of the rope slightly thicker in its, in its diameter. And loosening it off, it just means that it goes on a bit, a bit thicker. So you get a nice grubby looking taper. And just tie that in really tightly. Dave, have you used that directly off the ball of the wool, or yeah. have you taken a, um, uh, a ply off it? I took a ply, yeah. I just cut a cut a section off it. No, I mean, is it two ply or three ply? I can't remember. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. This, this is straight off the straight off the wool. Um, I haven't I haven't taken I haven't split it up. It's, right. Um, it, it, I think it's a two ply. Yeah, it, it basically you can see. Yeah, see it there. It's it, it's a two two ply rope. Um, I just use it as it is. Right. But what I do is, like I say, I just untwisted the um, untwisted it at the start, so it it flattens it down to two, I suppose, one ply strands, and then I start twisting it as we go up the up the hook to create that two ply effect. Yeah, got you, got you yeah. in there. So I'll just tie that thread, that silk off at the, at the head. And basically you've got there something that resembles a killer bug. Um, it looks very much like a grub or a, a maggoty thing um, that lives in the water. And you could, yeah. you could you could stop there, but there's one there's one extra bit that I do, um, which I I don't know whether it just gives me confidence or actually does enhance its attractiveness to the fish. But um, I always like to to do it. Um, it's just put a bit of colour in just behind the head. So I've got here a fluorescent orange um, thread. This this one is uh, is Vivas um, eight eight zero um <clears throat> it's quite a strong thread this this so it, it withstands a lot of uh, uh knocking around in the river without coming undone so i'm just going to create a subtle 
collar just behind the, the bead by just tying that in. And then doing maybe, I tend to use five, five turns just to create a, a little, little hot spot there. And I just find this, this particular orange goes quite nicely with the, uh, the color of the wool. Um, and when it's in the water, it, to me, to me anyway, it just looks, it looks, looks very attractive and it's, it's a very subtle type of, type of hot spot. And then just simply tie that off in your preferred bay. See, I'm, I'm not really a whip finisher myself. It's just habit and it, it's just quicker, I find. But you can do a whip finish at that point, as most people would. And there we go. Yeah, that's good. It's, it's just a very, very simple and functional killer bug style. Yeah. style fly. It's got, I think it's got the right sort of colours. It's it's so simple. You can tie these up in a matter of minutes. Can you, can you try do it showing the fly with the back of your hand? Do you know, you know what I mean? So leave it in the vice. Yeah. Leave it in the vice and then put your, your back of your hand behind it. Yeah, that's better. You can see the colours yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. The light isn't shining on it so much. It's nice. It's really nice. It's a really simple fly. The other thing that inspired me about this fly was, I don't know if, if you're you're familiar with this. Um, it's an American fly called the waltz worm. Very very simple. Sort of. I've it's heard it's, of that. It's basically it, it looks like this, but it uses um, I think hairs for um, as the body. It's basically just a hair's fur body yeah. and a copper tungsten bead. Um, and it's very, very simple fly, but it's very, very effective. That's why it's called waltz worm. Um, but there's a version of it called the sexy waltz, which is basically just got a, a, a tag, a fluorescent tag just behind the um, hot, spot, yeah. hot spot. So that's, that's where this came from. Sometimes yeah. that, that hot spot can make a difference. I, I, th I think it does. I did a little experiment. I know it's very, very difficult to do this properly in, in the river, but when I was fishing yesterday, I, I took a bit, took one out and I put it on without the hot spot. Um, I think I caught fish, but I put the hot spot on and I, I seemed to catch more fish. I don't know if it, was, it just gave me more confidence or whether it did actually have an effect. No, it, on fish, but sometimes, it, sometimes it can make a difference, can it? I think, I, I, I think I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it does. I, got, I certainly got a lot more takes to the, to the one with the hot spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going back to the beginning, um, you said about the copper wire being on basically the arse end of the fly. Yeah, yeah. Right. We had a discussion a few sessions ago, me and Paul Slaney, and I think Paul's on you tonight. And a lot of it is because, like Sawyer, used to tie his flies on the riverbank without a vice. Yeah, yeah. And when he used to hold the hook in his hand, he'd put the copper on, he'd catch yeah. the wool in at the, at the eye, he'd run the copper down, then he'd form the body down to the arse end, and then he'd tie off at the butt section. Yes. Yeah, because it makes it a lot easier to tie. So a lot yeah. of these classic old patterns come from that. Come from that. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And if you put it, if you think in your mind, if you start the body from the eye and whip down to just behind the bend, makes it easier to tie off two or three yeah. turns of copper, cut the wool yeah. away, two or three more turns, and then just whip finish or an half itch. Yeah. And that's why I, I think that's why you used to do it. I think I think you're probably right as well. Um, and it's a and it's a tried and tested pattern. I have caught. Thousands of grayling on it. it, it Thousands of grayling. Yeah, it's it's really it's really effective. It's it's interesting that it's not used very often with competition anglers. Oh, it is with this one. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you. A lot, a lot of the um, I don't know. I fish a fair few competitions on the on, on the Welsh D, for example, and um, yeah, you know, not many people will fish killer bugs or 
variations of, you know, pink pink shrimps. Seems pink to be. shrimps. Seems and they all go for tungsten beads. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, it, it, it's, it's certainly effective on, on, on our local rivers. And squirmy worms. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but very neat, very nice, nice pattern. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's very very simple. The secret is 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 in getting getting those those de those details correct. I think the proportions of it and yep. um, you know, whether the the orange color works. Yeah. Um, better not. You know, give it a try and see. You know, let let me know how you get on. I also put a little tag of mirage on some of mine as well, just to give a bit yeah. of glint. Yes. Yeah. 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 That that brings them on as well. I can never make my mind up on that, Gavin. I I, I, I sometimes do put, put the pearl ribs on them and then sometimes I, I think well you've got to you've got a tongue too many tongues to feed on the head you need a bit more yeah anything more and it, and it goes both ways I'm not I'm not sure whether it, it really um, puts the fish off but um I think I just I just keep chopping and changing my mind on those. Yeah. Also depends on the colour of the water as well. Yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. The, the, the the orange colour and the and the and the, the various tags Give me a lot of confidence if the water's slightly coloured or very coloured. Draining pattern, which has uh, I've, I've started using this just only in the last last few weeks or so since the, the last um, session down at the Unicorn, um, and it's done done pretty well as well. Um, this is not really a variation of any traditional design. Um, it, it's, it's really something I just came up with. I guess I was inspired partly by the, the Duracell jig, you know, the uh, really effective uh, jig pattern that Craig McDonald invented a few years ago um, using UV eye stubbing, um, but also trying to create something that looks more like a caddy scrub than a um, than, a, than, a, than an olive nymph in, in profile because um, railing do eat a, a lot of caddis scrubs, um, certainly in, the, in, in a lot of the, the local rivers that I, that I fish. So this is, I suppose, a, a, a caddis scrub type fly, but using using um, sort of UV materials and the, and the colours that seem to work really effectively with uh, flies like the Duracell. So I've got a size 14. Um, what hooks this? This is a, a FASNA um, F800, which is what they call a, uh, I think it's a, a, a grub or a shrimp hook. So it's slightly curved. Derek's probably going to say, that's not the hook that I used at the uh, at the demo in, in Ludlow, which is true. I used a jig hook actually for this one. Um, since then, I've, I've I've been tying this not in the jig style, but in with this curved hook, and I think it I think I prefer it to be honest with you um, as a, as a caddis pattern without without the jig hook. So I've I've, I've switched just recently. Tied so on both. Sorry. Tied on both hooks. Try on. I mean. Exactly, doesn't doesn't really matter. So I've got a that's a uh, three three millimeter silver countersunk tungsten there. And again, I'm going for the that's the yellow ultimate tying silk. I do tend to use yellow as my Bog standard colour when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm tying flies, um, unless there's a specific reason for um, having a, a different underbody. Um, part of the reason why I, I just think it's a really good colour to have underneath lots of nymphs and, and different dry flies because you know if you, if you crush insects, the, in, the inside of insects tends to be yellow. So <laughs> it sounds a bit a bit a bit crazy, but I do think if there's any colour you're going to have underneath underneath your flies, if you you know, a yellow is a really good sort of natural looking colour that um, that you know gives off the uh, 
the impression of food to, to many fish. So the next, um, once the thread's on, I then go to the, the ribbing and this is uh, red wire in um, point zero, 0 0.18 diameter. So it's fairly chunky, sort of red copper wire type, type stuff. And I'll start tying this in, not from the, the head. I know a lot of people like to slot the, the wire into the tungsten bead to keep it all nice and neat because I'm trying to create a caddis scrub profile. Um, these caddis scrub tend to have quite a bulbous rear end um, and they tend to go a bit slimmer towards the head. So I'll tie this in just before the, the bend of the hook. So it just creates a slight, slightly thicker underbody at that back end. And I'll just go around the, the bend of the hook. And then it's um, it's the dubbing. So I've got a whole load of different ice UV ice dubbings here. The one I'm going for is the uh, the light brown. This one here. So there's different shades going from purple through to this is the um, what they call that. This is the dark brown um, hairline dubbing. And then this is cinnamon hens. And then this is light brown Hemingways. Hemingway's ice dubbing. Just take a good thick, thick chunk of dubbing. These caddis scrub, they're not slim creatures, so um, don't make the body too, too slim on them. This stuff dubs on really nicely. And I'm just trying to taper it so it's quite thick at the at the back end, but it tapers slightly towards towards the front. And then we'll just tie all that onto the hook. and go forward with the, the rib. Pulling this in quite tight, you'll notice I've, I've, I've dubbed it fairly loosely, but I'm now gonna go in and rib it really tightly so it just creates that soft succulent profile um, to the, the abdomen, which these caddis larvae have. And I've got fairly widely spaced open turns And just tie that off right at the head, just behind the bead. Pull off the wire. And then I'm just gonna put another small pinch of this, this dubbing in, just to create a little spacing point for the hackle. So I'm gonna go in with a soft hackle in a minute. and. Just want to create a slight raised <clears throat> just so the hackle's got something to to help splay it out and keep it like that rather than just having it all flattened against the body of the fly so nice bit of english um, gray partridge a lot of that in my my time my nymphs i'm really keen on soft soft hackles so select a, a nice feather from the uh front part of the skin where it's where we have all those really soft feathers and to prepare the the feather it's exactly the same as i would prepare a feather for tying any of the spiders 
so I'll just take off a lot of these these fibers that um, that we don't need. So you're just left with the ones that the right length that you want. What I'll also do is take off fibers from one side of the um, of the the feather stalk. So I've actually just got one one layer um, on one side. It just creates a much neater looking looking hackle and slightly sparser, I suppose, than um, than if you try and do it with with, with two sides. And this is this is a technique that I think a lot of the really traditional spider patterns use, but um, I quite like it when I'm, when I'm tying these nymphs because you get just a neater but sparser looking leggy kind of hackle. So I'll just create a, a V at the head end. So that's the that's the, the, the top of the feather. I'll just pull the feathers that I want to use for the, the hackle backwards like that. So it just creates there a little V, I suppose. So you can then lock that in with thread. Trim off the waist bit. That's your feather tied in from the, the tip of the stalk. And then it's a case of just winding that round. It's usually, I usually get a turn and a half. Um, if, I, if, I've, if I've prepared the feather correctly, I'm looking for about a turn and a half of, of hackle. So, it's not very thick, but it gives a, a good splay of, of, of legs. And movement. And movement, that's, yeah. And I think that's the key to the success of this one. And, and the, the next fly, I'm going to tie the last one I'll do after this is, um, is, a, is another nymph, nymph pattern. And this soft tackle, again, a bit like, that, a bit like the hot spot in the previous one, I, I, I find it, it, it gives me confidence when I'm, when I'm fishing these flies. Um, I don't just use it for flies that, that, that fish sort of high up in the water like spiders. I'll, I'll, I'll put these soft tackles on flies that I'm putting, you know, really large tungsten beads on and fishing, fishing near the, the bed of the river. So the final part of this relatively simple fly um, is just a, another bit of that UV dubbing just around the front of the hackle to tidy things off. Very good. That's it. It's um, it's got that UV going through it, which really makes it glow in the water. It's got the red, the red um, ribbing, which I think it, it goes really well uh, with that sort of purpley um, color that you get from the UV. But you've got this. It's it's not too in your face. It's a bit more subtle than the original Duracell. Um, the original Duracell actually uses the um, uses this dubbing here, um, which is slightly more, more purpley colour. This is the, um, yeah. the hairline brown UV. Uh, this is the slightly lighter one, and it's it's more translucent as well. So it's got the colour, the colours that graining like that um, UV purpley colour, but it's it's a little bit more 
natural, I suppose, looking. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good, good pattern for having on the points this time of year. And, and you know, that, that soft tackle um, is something I, I really like on these, on these flies. Gives it a really nice caddis scrub looking, looking profile. So if, if you're still interested in another fly, I've got one more to, to show. Come on, let's have it. <laughs> this, is, um, this is one that um, I suppose I, I, I fish a lot all, all through the season. This, this is probably my, um, my stand, most standard nymph pattern, but it's particularly good this time of year. Um, going, going into the winter as a, as a point fly for grayling, it's... Uh, it's a variation of, um, of the other Frank Sawyer classic, the pheasant tail nymph, although um, it's probably barely recognisable um, apart from just the uh, the pheasant tail that I use for the use for the body. Um, what I've got here, I've got a the same hook that I used for the, the killer bug, size eighteen, wide gate. Jig. You can get these these from from Hannock, uh, from Fasner. Well, this this one is from from Fish On. Fish On do a good range of these hooks at you know an affordable price, really really good quality. And um, I've got um, because this is a point fly, and I often fish it in in quite fast flowing and deep rivers like the Welsh the Welsh D this time of year. Um, all, the, all of the other big rivers, sort of the, the upper seven, for example. Um, put a four millimeter tungsten bead. The, the other reason I've done that is I quite like to have quite like quite often um, put large tungsten, tungsten beads on small hooks. It's a bit of a bit of a lot of debate about this. Um, it seems to be quite fashionable with competition anglers to use small hooks, put large beads on it, but it does seem to improve the, um, the the strike rate that you get particularly from larger grayling. I do, I do think a lot of the lot of the bugs that um, the, the various insects and vertebrates that live live down on the bottom bar some of the big caddis flies are quite small so when the fish get a bit finicky they probably switch off going for these outsized large um, offerings that that, um, that we tend to have if, if you use anything with slightly larger hook size. So thread is exactly the same. My standard, standard yellow, yellow silk thread. Just tie that in there. Um, and then for the tails, it's the standard favorite of Tim Wood and um, Lots of other river anglers is the the Coq de Leon. Uh, Tim Tim demonstrated this last week with with uh, at least one of his flies. Very natural looking tailing material and it's virtually indestructible. You can use the, the, the traditional tying of pheasant tails. Use the pheasant tail fibers as a tail, um, which is fine. They they don't tend to be that robust when you're bouncing them around on the riverbed um, in fast fast flowing water. So this is my preference. I'll take about five or so um, cocktail on tails. Of course, the, the natural insect that this represents is a uh, flattened olive mayfly, something like a March brown nymph. They have exclusively three, three tails. Um, fish can't count and as long as it creates the right profile, you know, just gives a little bit of extra. So I'll make that about the same length as the as the as the as the hook. Tie that in just to the bend of the hook. I 
back up to the top. And then for the for the rib, um, we're going to use gold wire, slightly finer gauge than the uh, the red wire I used on the previous fly. I think most people would probably say they would prefer to use copper wire because it matches the copper bead, um, and that's absolutely fine. The, re the reason I've gone for, for, for gold is it just stands out a little bit better, I think, in the water. And, and the natural insects do have quite light colours between the, um, uh, the different um, bits of exoskeleton on, on, on the, the abdomen of the insect, so th there is quite a light ribbing effect on the on the natural so it goes some way towards imitating that I suppose so I'll just tie that in this time right from the front I'm not wanting to create a, a fatter back section this is going to be a fly that tapers from the rear to the to the front so the, the gold in there. And then the body is the uh, cock pheasant tail. Usually go for somewhere between six or eight fibers. This is not a super slim fly. Um, and that's, that's deliberate really. Um, a lot of our nymphs are are very, very slim. Um, the ones that imitate the, the basis mayflies, the olive mayflies, because they are very slim nymphs. Um, but this is much more um, imitating the, the flattened bodied mayflies. And those guys are much, much chunkier in their, in their profile. So you don't need to be too shy about the, uh, uh, the, width, of the, the width of the body. So I'll just come in there and tie, tie that in um, from the, the tips. So by doing that, it also then means that when you wind the body, you get that tapered profile. Then I'm just gonna come back up with touching turns of the pheasant tail. And tie that off right behind the bead. Then follow that with turns of the wire in open turns in the opposite direction of the pheasant tail. So it, it crosses over in the opposite direction and locks it, locks it in nicely. Pinch the wire off. Okay. Um, no. Back to the favourite soft hackle, the partridge. Now this is this is the bit that might seem seem a bit unusual to you. Um, I'm going to use use a dubbing that's um, not often used really. Um, 
basically I've gone into my my waste bin underneath my my vice here. Um, I always I always keep loads of the stuff in the waste bin because I find that you quite quite often get some really nice nice bits of dubbing material um, sat around there, which you, you know you can you can you can get for free. Um, you don't often need lots of um, other other materials if you just want to you know a natural looking looking dubbing. And what I'm going to do here is, is is take some of the the waste fibres of the of the partridge, which I, I used on the previous fly. I'm just going to use use that as as a dubbing material. So I'll put that in my palm of my hands, and then I'm just going to circle that up just so it creates a bit of a, a ball of dubbing. So the fibres are, are all pointing in different directions. And then I'm going to dub that onto the rope. And I just find that it, it's not just because I'm a cheapskate and I don't want to fork out on, on dubbing. This, I find that this tightly wrapped mass of, of partridge feather creates a really nice natural looking, looking body. Um, for these insects, it's you know, that the barred patterns in the, in the feathers and the um, and the sort of the, the, the grey and the texture it just looks very similar to those nymphs. If you, if you ever pull them out of the river and you and you, and you look at the, um, the the wing cases of them, so I'll just put some just a couple of turns there, just in front of where I'm going to put the uh, the feather fibre, just to give it a, a, a place to push the, the fibres out and keep them standing away from the body of the, of the fly. Do you only do that with partridge feathers, Dave, or do you do it with other feathers? I, 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 I favour partridge, to be honest with you, for these, these flies, but you could easily use other things. Um, there's, there's one good uh, substitute you can use, which is is Brahma, Brahma hen, right way around. You can buy, you can buy this. Um, it's another sort of soft hackle material. Um, that's that's very good as well. You can, you can obviously use things like um, coots or um, moorhen, for example. So similar to what you'd use on some of these spider patterns. I, I just I, I I personally like um, partridge just because of, you know the, the color there and it it, it does re resemble the um, the actual natural barred effect on that the nymphs have so I'll just show you what I'm attempting to to imitate so we're looking at uh, some of these these nymphs here so you can see that it's not a very slim insect it's got a very very big flat wide head but it's got these very noticeable barred legs and when that's in the water if you ever see them swimming around it's that's a really key feature so it's probably something that the fish spots quite quite readily and I do think that the um, the partridge you know, represents those legs quite quite nicely so I'm preparing the partridge feather in exactly the same way as uh, as I did with that other fly. Now, what I should have said, Davis, do you only use the waste of, of the partridge feather for dubbing, or do you use other feathers' waste for dubbing? Oh, yeah. You, the, the reason I use I use partridge is um, partly because um, when I'm I've, I've got I've got it here, just you know. So I've just pulled a chunk off the feathers, so it's 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 just available. Um, but also, I think I think the, the color the color it gives a really nice um, mottled mottled effect to, to the body, and it matches the color of the of the legs. It just it do, it do, it does look quite realistic when it's when it's wet as well. So uh, that's the, the partridge feather prepared with the fibers stripped off one side leaving just the lengths that, that I want. So I'll then just pull the fibers back. to where I want them, like that.
and then tie it in from the tip. And an extra turn there just to lock it, lock it in. This is, this is a method that Derek actually showed us last time. When you've got um, feather stalk there, if you do a couple of turns, pushing that stalk in the, in, the, in the reverse direction, it just locks it in. So when, you, when you're putting tension on uh, the hackle pliers, it just prevents it from just slipping out. Really good little technique there, Derek, thanks. And it's a case of just uh, winding that hackle around. Again, it's around about one and a half turns is absolutely perfect for this fly. You don't want it too thick because A, it looks natural and it does affect the sinking rates. And this is a fly that we, we want to fish right at the, on the bottom of the river. It's also with a four mil tung tungsten bead, we want to use it to anchor the, uh, the, the other flies down right into the feeding zone. And then finish the fly off with another bit of um, partridge feather as the as, as dubbing. So I'm just going to go in there to uh, the waste feathers that that I've just I've just cut off. I used to use just a bit, bit of squirrel hair for this stage. Um, and then one day I just I just experimented with this and I just really liked the, the effect that it gave. But I think you can probably use use hair or squirrel just as effectively if you prefer. So it's just a little bit just to cover the threads at the front. And tie it off. Do you ever use varnish? That's a good point. With these um, silk threads, I never use varnish. No? No, because you, you just don't you just don't need to. They're really, really tough, really strong, and I've never ever had a a uh, fly fall apart even after loads of fish. So I will use varnish if I use other types of threads, um, standard tying thread, but um, you, you just don't need to use it with this. And that's, that just, it saves time. And it also means you don't have to worry about varnish getting getting on these uh, um, rather scruffy materials at the, at the front of these flies. Yeah. It's, that's very, takes me back to a Hendrix spider, to be honest. It's very, very similar to an Hendrix spider. In fact, yeah. um, it's like an Hendrix spider with a, with, a, with a bloody great tungsten bead on it. That's it, yes. Um, those of you at the club last time will notice this is a slightly different one. Uh, this one hasn't got the fluorescent tag. Um, which one I think tie at the club. This is the other version of it. And I just thought I'd tie the one without the tag just, just for, for variety. But as we were saying earlier with the killer bug, um, I do tend to find that having a, um, a fluorescent hotspot really improves the effectiveness of these flies. So I will generally use this version with a, uh, it's got a, got a it's got the same mm, orange yeah. color. And it's got, it's tied in at the butt there. That's the number four again, yeah? Yeah, no, no, it's not. Num it's not number four. This is um, this is this Beavis. All right, okay, right. But it's exactly the same as Blow Bright number five. I think it is. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's my standard one with the rest. Of the butt, but in, in very clear water, or sometimes if the fish <laughs> um, needs need something different, 
Well, they're a yeah. bit from the key then, just a plain version here that uh, Gavin quite rightly said is, is very similar to an Endrick Spider. Yeah. Um, but the, um, I mean, it's interesting that some people say to me, do you prefer to use the um, the trigger point in the in the butt or, or, or in the collar like we did on the killer bug? And for these flies, I tend to prefer it in the butt because um, it just helps with the profile of the fly. Um, and also, if you look at the look at the naturals, there is a slight orange color. Yeah, you see towards the towards the back end, and some of the ones you pull out of the river, they they can look quite orange. So, you know, whether that makes a difference to the fish or not, I don't know. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely not not one for exact copies of flies, but giving that general, you know, size, shape, and impression. And, um, well, exactly. I, if that's going to be five foot down in fast forming water, the yeah. gradient is not going to go, hold on, where's my micrometer? Let's have a look at this. No, no. He's no. going to take it. But that looks like, it, it looks like something that's got legs yeah. flying around. It's got, got a little hot spot that makes them, that they can, they can see. Um, and it's that profile as well, you know, not, not being afraid to use that massive bead. Because as I say, the, um, you know, they, these things have got big heads and they're not, they're not slim. They're not like, you know, these are the, these are the, the baited, the standard pheasant tail nymphs, your, um, you know, your little hairs is, you know, we tie them as really slim bodies because those, those, they, those creatures are, but these, these flat bodied ones, which they, uh, they do um, form quite a large part of the diet of fish during the winter time. They're quite chunky. And quite like, little bull, like little bull terriers. They are, aren't they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's going to be loads of movement in that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that. yeah, I've got, that's my my secret nymph secret pattern. That is, which I use it pretty much all the time. I mean, if I had one, if I had one nymph to use exclusively, I'd happily fish this this all year round in any, yeah. any river. It was your secret nymph day. Sorry? It was your secret. <laughs> I mean, it's not. It's not. You'll see plenty of people tying tying flies. Yes. Yeah, just like this. Yeah. Then, then, yeah. then they're not. They're not really that original. Maybe, maybe I can claim the dubbing, using the um, um, using the feather fiber as the dubbing. Um, but uh, no, it's uh, it's just a, a style of fly that, that that is that is very very effective. I find. Well, it's got the three things you need. You fish it where the fish are. It's got yeah. the colour and it's got movement, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. That's it. Would you would you tend tend to fish them a little bit bigger than this, Gavin? Um, size? No, I I'd, I'd go to that. Yeah. I use, four, I use a four mil or four point five mil sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got a pattern that's very very similar to that, and I, I think I put it on uh, the Ludlow site quite a while back. But it's got a mirage tag, then it's got the hotspot, hair body, but the front of it's basically the same partridge, bit of dubbing in the front and pull it forward. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very, very similar. Yeah, yeah. Just combination of works, isn't it? That's it. That's Just combination it. Combination of works. And like you said, don't be afraid to use a big bead. Yeah, yeah. Because if it's not on the deck, they ain't going to take it. That's absolutely right. Yeah. You know, you can have a 3.2 mil, but if it's not, if you can't feel it bumping on the bottom because the water's too swift, then they're not going to take it. You might get the odd one, but not as many as you want. No, no. And of course, because of the shape of the hook, the jig hook, you've got the heavy bead, it swims upside down. You don't lose so many flies. It's true. Because, <laughs> it, it, co it, because it cocks in the water, so the hook is yeah. pointing up. Yeah, so you don't yeah. you don't get as many tangles as you <coughs> don't lose as many in the rocks. That's why the that's, jig hook was made. That's right. That's right. That's why they designed it. Do you ever offset your hooks? To be honest, I don't I don't do that very often. Um I have done a couple of times um in the past, but it's not something I I I I I, I really really bother doing much these days, Gavin. No. 
Do you mean off, offsetting it? Do you mean um, taking the hook point out from the from the eye? Yes, really yeah. offset, isn't it? A yeah. little bit more than what you think you can. Yeah. Because there's a little test you can do. You can, if you tie that to a bit of leader, run it over the back of your hand. Yeah. It doesn't catch. But if you offset the hook quite violently, to be honest, yeah, you probably catch your skin every time. And with hooking fish, a lot of the international competition boys do it. They don't tell you, but they do. <laughs> because it improves your hooking rate. Yes, yes. It does improve, but you've got to know your hooks. Partridge hooks, you can bend them. The Haneck hooks, forget about it. They'll snap. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they can be very brittle. So you've, you've got to know your hooks when you do that. Yeah. Let's let, let's see these. I could try that now and see, see whether these, these fish on hooks Ooh. stand up to it. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Oh, that's that's lovely. That's yeah, bending. right. There you are. Well, later, that... later on, do the little test, tie it to a yeah. leader and just pull it over the back of your hand. You see where, is that, is that, is that's, that, that's it. Is that offset enough or does it go even more? That's, that'll be, that'll, that'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try that and see if it makes a difference. That looks good. Like I said, a lot, of, a lot of internationals do it, but they don't tell you they do it. No, no. And some also offset them to the left and to the right, because it depends which side of the river you're fishing. That's interesting. Because if you're on the left-hand side, you offset it the wrong way, you won't hook the fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 I've seen lads going up the river and they're changing flies and changing flies and changing flies. And sometimes that's why they do, isn't it? as they cross. So if you get a little bit of trouble hooking fish, just offset them, really offset them, and give it a go. And sometimes you hold the rod and the fish hook themselves. Really? They don't strike in, they just bump, they're there. Yeah, yeah. Andy, little tip that Gav. Oh, I didn't realise you were all listening, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got any questions for Dave? No. On a, a, any of the flies he's tied tonight? It's all gone quiet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, once again, thanks, Dave. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Yeah, thank you. I, I did. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you very much. I did put these on the, the Level of Fly Tying Club uh, Facebook page, but what I think I I I don't know if I put them on on the, the the WhatsApp group yet. But the ones on the 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 Facebook page that it, it's got all the material list as well. Right. <laughs> Good. It's always nice to see other tyres and get their point of view. Always good to see it. Yeah. You can pick stuff up, can you? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, really, it's really good to get, get your um, tips as well, because, um, you know... That's what it's all about, isn't it? So many different ways of doing doing stuff. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not a pro pro tyre um, by, by any means. No, my, my, my style is, is generally trying yeah. to use simple functional flies to... To, to catch fish really um yeah. the one thing you i like now what you've done there is you've kept the hackle pointing yeah. up you haven't flattened it no no but you get a little pulsating movement when you actually fish it and that's good yeah that, that's the idea of putting the dubbing in uh, before the hackle yeah it just it does make a difference particularly when the flies um you know it's had a few swims and it's it's had a few fish it's little things like that that yeah do, but it's, do it's, just... it's movement yeah 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 it's bringing it to life. Yeah. Not like a squirmy worm. <laughs> <laughs> Which I hate them. I absolutely hate them. I know. But I tell you what, if you look at it, uh, they catch fish, mind. Yeah. They, they really they catch fish, but oh, I hate them. I hate them. It's like a blob. I hate them. No blobs either. A blob in a lake. No. <laughs> no. Right, I'm going to leave because Erin Doe's got to be picked up from work. 
Yeah. Another enjoyable night. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Well thanks. played, fair play. Well, thanks for coming and thanks, thanks for all your um, all your tips. Right. Tell them she'll have to wait a minute. Right. I can't. I've got to go. Okay. Right, lads. Bye, bye, all. Bye, Gav. Cheers, guys. Bye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Good evening. Mm-hmm.